Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Merhaba. Beyefendiler, merhaba. Panelimize hoş geldiniz. İklim değişikliği ve sağlık etkileriyle mücadele kapsamında Türkiye için yeşil mutabakat konulu panelinde panelde bir araya geliyoruz. Ulusal Halk Sağlığı Kongresi'nde ismim Ann Stauffer Hill Sağlık ve Çevre İttifakı Genel Direktör Yardımcısıyım. Avrupa'da ve diğer bölgelerde bütün toplum için sağlıklı bir ortam oluşturmak üzere çalışmalar yürütüyoruz. Sayın Berkay Hacı Mustafa ve Funda Gacal Hilden arkadaşlarım ve Sophie Perut'la birlikte ve diğer panelistlerimizle birlikte bugün sizlere yeşil mutabakatın Türkiye için getirebileceği sağlık etkilerinden bahsedeceğiz. İklim krizi anlamında biz bunu değerlendireceğiz. Çünkü bildiğiniz gibi 21. yüzyılın en büyük e, sağlık krizinin de tetikleyicisi olarak görülüyor iklim krizi. İklim krizinin Avrupa'da sağlık üzerindeki etkilerini hepimiz gördük. Hem Türkiye'de hem de kıtanın geri kalan bölgelerinde yaşadığımız sıcaklık dalgaları e, ve diğer e, Aşırı hava olayları iklim krizinin kapımıza dayandığını ve artık hayatımızı etkilediğini gösteriyor. Ve bir an önce hareket, harekete geçmemiz gerektiğini de gösteriyor. Yeşil mutabakat yaklaşımı iklim değişikliğinin getirdiği bu zorlu durumla mücadele etmek için hepimiz için bir çözüm görünebilir. Fosil yakıtların kullanımını durdurmak ve yeşil bir hayatı hayat tarzımız haline getirmek hepimizin elinde. Avrupa, Avrupa Birliği'nde, Amerika Birleşik Devletleri'nde e, giderek daha popüler haline gelen bir kavram bu. Ve Avrupa Birliği'de 2050'ye kadar iklim nöt duruma erişmek üzere bir yeşil mutabakat hazırladı. Ve Mayıs 2021'de sıfır kirlilikle ilgili de bir eylem planı hazırladı. Zaten webinarımızda bununla ilgili de detayları in, inceleyeceğiz. Avrupa Yeşil Mutabakatı to make all sectors of the economy more sustainable, transport, agriculture, buildings, industry, and if implemented right, this European Green Deal can be a game changer. And equally important, the European Green Deal also has a social component, with a goal of leaving no one behind. But unfortunately, this often falls short in policy deliberations. With this webinar, we want to take a closer look at the Green Deal framework and discuss the opportunities for Turkey for adopting a Green Deal. As in November 2021, Turkey has ratified the Paris Agreement and has actually set a goal of climate neutrality for 2053. I understand also that a specific climate law is in the making. At the same time, Turkey is still set for an increase in coal power generation as part of economic growth goals. So actually there are some promising but also contradictory developments that we want to have a look at with a Green Deal lens. And as this is a conference of the health sector, in this webinar we want to specifically consider how measures to green the economy could also help to reduce ill health in Turkey and the role of the health sector in bringing forward a Green Deal. And this is also something that my organization has been very much promoting at European level. I'm delighted that we have three excellent speakers with us here today who will shed light on Green Deal and Health, and I'll introduce them in a minute as we come to their presentations. Before we start, let me just say two further things. This webinar here today is organized as part of the activities of an EU-funded research project on building the capacity of the Turkish health sector on environment and climate. It's called CSIP, and it's implemented by HEAL, Hasudur, and the Department of Public Health at Coachele University. And we also have some housekeeping rules for today. Becca, if you could please uh, share the slide so I can quickly go through them. Okay, I just need to have a second. There you go. So um, there is simultaneous translation into English and Turkish. You can select uh, English by clicking the English simultaneous option. 
Uh, and most importantly, we want to have this as an interactive uh, exchange with you. So please do share your questions or comments. You can send them either in uh, English or Turkish. It's totally fine if it's in Turkish. We'll uh, make sure we, and the panel, the we reach, um, we get them in English uh, via the button Sorusor, ask a question, which you can find uh, in your screen. Uh, and this panel is being recorded. It will not be possible to ask a question directly with your microphone, but only via the Sorusor button. Uh, after each presentation, we'll, we'll see if there are clarification question, and then we'll definitely have time for a longer uh, discussion and exchange at the end. Thank you very much. And with this, I would actually like to introduce the first speaker here today, who is Rob Abrams. Rob is the Climate and Health Lead at Medact UK, supporting members and partners to organize the Health Voice on climate issue. Rob is an organizer with a background in the UK's climate movement, with experience campaigning around a number of areas related to climate justice, including but not limited to divestment, ending fossil fuel sponsorship of the arts and opposing major extractive projects. And MEDEC is an organization that grew out of the medical peace movement and was formed in 1992. Its mission is to support health professionals from all disciplines to work together towards a world in which everyone can truly achieve and exercise their human right to health. And Rob, you will now speak to us about the public health case for Green New Deal. Thank you very much for being here and the floor is yours. Thank you so much for having me, Anne. Merhaba, Irgunla, Memnum This is about the extent of which my Turkish goes for now, unfortunately, so I can't say much more. But as I, as, as I mentioned, I'm Rob. I'm from uh, MedAct in the UK. I'm just going to try and share my screen. Um, there we go. You should be able to see that. Great. Um, yes, that works. So lovely to meet you all, and thank you so much for having me here today. As Anne began to touch on, MedAct is a public health campaigning organisation in the UK, and our mission is to support the health community to work together towards a world in which everyone can truly exercise their human right to health. And the campaign that I'm involved in coordinating in the UK is called Health for a Green New Deal, which aims to build uh, mass support within the health community for a transformative Green New Deal uh, and support those working in health to organise for a just transition to zero carbon. So I'm sort of just going to, for the first bit of this, just go over what it is we mean exactly by uh, the Green New Deal. Because there are different iterations of the Green New Deal, Green Deal, depending where in the world we are. Um, so when I'm talking about a Green New Deal, what I'm referring to is a 10-year action plan on a government level that's guided by five principles. And the principles are to rapidly cut our emissions. Um, and I'm going to go over these policy details in a bit more detail later, but just to go over the top line. Um, second, create millions of secure and well-paid jobs. Thirdly, build thriving public services. Four, tackle rampant inequality, both on a domestic and global level. And five, stand shoulder to shoulder um, with people around the world fighting for climate justice. So in that context, I kind of just want to spell out a little bit of actually, because, you know, we, we talk about a Green Deal, the European Union's Green Deal and the Green New Deal. But the truth is then they're not the same thing. So just to sort of clarify what I'm talking about, because there is a little bit of a difference. So the European Green Deal, um, we campaign for a, a Green New Deal, and it's a concept that's become uh, quite popular in recent years in, in the English speaking world in North America and the UK. Um, the European Union Green Deal, it aims for net zero by 2050, and it has been criticized for largely relying on private finance and redirecting that towards sustainable practices but it has been criticized also for being a plan for preservation and not transformation uh, the green new deal that we campaign here for in the uk we aim to eliminate emissions by 2030 to 35 um, and there's a strong ownership on uh, you know there's a strong focus on public ownership um, and in in the more ambitious versions of the green new deal that we campaign for in the uk it incorporates criticisms uh, from communities in the global south um, around what has been called green colonialism. Uh, and I'll touch a little bit more on, on that in just a little bit. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about why, why health for a Green New Deal? Why, why are we mobilizing the health sector and raising up the health voice in particular? So here is a collection 
of different news headlines from both the UK and around the world in just the last year. Um, we see everything from, you know, ha record numbers of households that are falling into fuel poverty, not being able to heat their homes. Um, we're seeing the World Health Organization predict that there may be as much as 250,000 additional deaths per year by 2030 from resulting from the climate crisis. We're seeing millions of people in the UK vulnerable to climate change. Uh, we're seeing the world's first recorded uh, death as a result of air pollution, which was the Ella Kissy Deborah case in London, um, uh, in which a, a nine-year-old nine girl sadly died because of the effects of air pollution. Um, and we see, you know, there have been wildfires that we've seen all across the world in just the last year, you know, even within the Arctic Circle in Siberia, and of course, in, in Turkey and in southern Turkey in the, in, in the past summer, um, which sadly resulted in a lot of uh, damage and loss. Um, and in the bottom right hand corner, I just want to point out this case of even here in London, um, we're seeing operations cancelled because of a hostel being flooded uh, during floods that we had here uh, some months ago. So this all goes to show and highlight the extent to which the climate crisis is impacting our health and how it's having a really disastrous impact and how, how we might be able to sort of talk more about the climate crisis through the lens of public and global health. So I'm gonna come out of sh sharing this particular screen for a second. I'm gonna see if my video works. I'm just gonna share uh, with you a video that's a couple of minutes long from the US um, and hopefully uh, you should be able to hear the sound, but we'll figure that out if you can't. I'm an accidental environmentalist. For me, as a doctor and as somebody who's always focused on public health, I'd always say, look, you got babies dying. We should be focused on that. I never really appreciated how fundamental was until I became health commissioner in Ta, de Detroit. And in my role, I saw exactly what it was that was causing climate change as it was being funneled through the lungs of small children. Right now, we have an energy system that predicates our ability to light our spaces and uh, to drive our cars on taking stuff out of the ground and then burning it into the lungs of our children. And in this city alone, our kids are three times as likely to be hospitalized for asthma than the state average. And that has everything to do with the kind of air pollution that uh, we see coming out of smokestacks. Not only will climate change devastate uh, the very space we call home in, on this globe, but also uh, the means of climate change is hurting people directly in local communities uh, that are industrial like the city of Detroit. It's hard. It's hard when you have a child that's born with uh, compromised lungs. Where we are today, we're here in Southwest Detroit, 4217. This is an area where many African Americans came north to find jobs at the oil refinery, at the automotive industry, and the steel mills. This was the first area that African Americans were allowed to come and buy homes. We have more than 33 heavily pollutant industries that are located in the Southwest Detroit area. Over the years, Southwest Detroit has seen a serious rise in cancer. And I mean, all types of cancer, lung cancer, pancreatic cancer, brain cancer. We are a community and a people that have been marginalized, have been ignored and left behind. If I could be a constructor of the Green New Deal, it would be a future for my children and grandchildren to have air that is not brown, that is not black with pollution. The poor would have equity. That's what a Green New Deal would be if I could construct it. So I'm just gonna go back into presentation mode. So what we saw here, um, what we saw there was um, a video with uh, Dr. Abdul Saeed, who's the former health director of the city of Detroit in America. Uh, and what that really highlights is, you know, the extent to which climate and health and like a Green New Deal and public health is related to the extent that we see in, you know, someone who is an epidemiologist by background sort of becoming a, what, what is known as an accidental environmentalist. So for just the last few minutes of my talk, I'm just going to go through some of the sort of the policies that we're fighting for uh, with the Health for a Green New Deal campaign. So, our, you know, first policy area is decarbonizing the energy, energy system. So the problem here is that there is a huge disparity in global energy consumption. So the average citizen in the UK, for example, consumes energy at 2.5 times the level the planet can support. Um, and there are roughly 770 million people worldwide who lack access to electricity. 
Uh, and within that, you know, working class and racialized, um, racially minoritized communities are more likely to live within a three mile radius of fossil fuel infrastructure, where, um, you know, 1% of the global population is responsible for approximately half of global emissions. So we're calling for a just transition to zero carbon to a zero carbon economy, uh, supported by investments in renewable energies and green jobs. And we're highlighting this is needed by 2030, not 2050. Um, you know, 2050, after you know, the projections we've seen from the UN in the last year, 2050 is far too late and the global ambition needs to be raised. Um, a globally just transition in which uh, the countries in the global north, former colonial industrialized powers, for example, such as the UK, um, help fund the cost of the transition for the nations in the global south. And this includes the paying of climate reparations and cancelling debt. Uh, as well as we've got to end the vast subsidies afforded to fossil fuels and other polluting industries. Uh, green jobs for all. So as I mentioned, you know, something that we're, you know, we're campaigning for is creating a vibrant green economy. Um, and this is partly to address the mass unemployment in the wake of COVID-19. Um, and also to sort of address the fact that, you know, even before the pandemic, work was making us sick. Epidemiological studies have indicated that unemployment resulting in poor, you know, it's been re resulting in poor mental and physical health. Um, yet poor quality, you know, work may even be more harmful than unemployment. So research by the UK's Trade Union Congress has shown that with adequate state investment, around 1.24 million green jobs could be created in just two years. Uh, and key, you know, public services such as health and social care, you know, play a vital role as low carbon sectors, relatively speaking, that need investment both to meet current gaps in provision and to reach their own zero carbon tar targets. And of course, these jobs must, you know, we're demanding that these must be secure, unionized and pay a living wage. Healthy air. Um, so air pollution is an immediate public health emergency. Um, you know, it's intrinsically linked to the climate crisis and is disproportionately impacting marginalized groups of people. So in London, for example, 80 percent of schools are experiencing that are experiencing illegal level, levels of air pollution are found in the most deprived areas. And around seven million premature deaths are related to air pollution every year uh, around the globe. So schemes to reduce traffic in urban areas and create walkable towns and cities are not only just good for, you know, reducing air pollution, they're good for our mental well-being and social cohesion in general. Um, but we must not treat electric vehicles as a silver bullet. We've got to have a focus on free zero emissions public transport that can be created with the right levels of state investment. Uh, and this can help reduce, you know, the resource exploitation that go that comes with electric vehicles and also help provide equitable access to our communities. Um, and as we've seen in, in, in the UK and elsewhere, the benefits of public transport have been most felt when train and bus lines have been brought back into public ownership. Quality homes for all. So I'm sorry, this is very UK focused, but just to go on a UK level, um, there are around 1.6 million households, about 3.8 million people who are in need in social rented housing and about 1.2 million households that are on waiting lists. Uh, and about 45% of social tenants and a third of private renters are living in poverty. Um, so unaffordable housing has led to segregation in our communities and the lack of affordable housing has exacerbated things like overcrowding, which has meant that in some areas of the UK and elsewhere in Europe, we've seen spikes in conditions such as tuberculosis and this has also exacerbated the severity of the COVID-19 pandemic. So the solutions, as well as building new sustainable social housing, we can also, uh, we also need a national retrofitting task force that could upgrade our housing stock and also create new jobs in upgrading those homes. Um, and we've, you know, studies have shown in the UK that as much as £418 per year could be saved on energy bills if you're retrofitting homes. Um, and it'll also help reduce the burden on emergency departments within National Health Service. Um, so we've also like started calling for you know the introduction of rent controls and giving tenants greater rights because this would be a really good place to start in creating this new sustainable housing system that we need. And lastly, but not least, food and land justice. Um, so globally, agriculture is the biggest driver of land use and deforestation, uh, and rearing livestock is responsible for about sixty percent of biodiversity loss. Um, in, industrialized agriculture is leading to land grabs as well, in which. Investors are seeking to exploit cash crops. So for example, palm oil, uh, which is creating monocultures where not much else can you know, thrive. Um, and the financial pressures of the industry have created a situation in which 50% of those experiencing hunger globally are actually small scale farmers. So we recently saw this come to a head with the massive 
mass protests in India, for example, um, where um, you know the, the the the farming community encamped outside Delhi and other major cities, put pressure on the government. Um, and you know, more than 2.3 billion people around the world are malnourished, and 150 million children are stunted by hunger. But a third of our food globally is thrown away. So solutions, agricultural subsidies can be shifted to support farming methods that preserve ecosystems and provide nutritious food. Um, and research has shown that the rollout of sustainable farming could add as much as $75.6 trillion to the global economy every year. Uh, the Lancet Commission's planetary diet uh, could actually help us avert as many as 10 million deaths per year by lower, lower helping to lower rates of strokes, heart disease, and diabetes. Um, and this will come along with like a reduction of meat production and food waste. Um, so in the UK and Scotland in particular, land reforms have been trialled that show how, you know, we could be creating these community land trusts that could help us bring uh, land back into public hands and also at the same time incentivize agro-ecologically -eco sustainable farming and public and cooperative food hubs. So that's just a very quick whiz through the policies that uh, we're demanding here in the UK with the Health for Green New Deal campaign. I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Sorry if I've gone a little bit over uh, over time, but um, yeah, just wanted to say to Shikola, thank you for having me so much. And um, yeah, looking forward to the conversation. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Rob, for this uh, excellent kickoff of our conversation today and, and for really raising the important issues we need to be uh, considering when we're talking about uh, Green New Deal. Uh, and I also like it very much that you showed that, you know, it's actually not, there's not the one concept of a Green Deal. It's, it's actually, you know, it, it very much ranges. Uh, and uh, also that we as a health sector have to be mindful uh, when it comes to you know green rhetoric versus uh, actual you know measures that will that will really green the economy and achieve uh, social justice and better health. Uh, okay, I don't see that there are any uh, clarification questions, so I suggest that we move on to our next uh, speaker, which is uh, Professor Ahmed Atil Asici from Istanbul, uh, Tech Istanbul Technical University. Welcome. Thank you very much for being here with us today. Uh, your background is after graduating from the Management Engineering Department at ITU in 1996, Ahmed completed his master's studies at Bogan Tsusi University and his PhD at the University of Geneva in 2007. He worked as an Associate Economic Officer at Jungtat between 2005 and 2006. And Ahmed has published extensively on the relationship between economic growth and sustainability and on green transformation. He's been a faculty member at the ITU Management Engineering Department since 2009 and was a 2020-21 MacArthur IPC Fellow with a project titled Green New Deal for Turkey. Excellent. Uh, and Ahmed, you will now speak to us about the opportunities for Green Deal in Turkey, more specifically about the potential effects of the EU's carbon border adjustment mechanism on the Turkish economy. The floor is yours, Ahmed. Thank um, you. Uh, Thank you very much. My slides will be in English. Let me share them. But I'll be addressing the audience in Turkish. I think you can see my slides now. Yes. You Mark, uh, bahsetti, Avrupa bahsetti, uyuz... Rob, who uh, spoke before me, talked about the European Green Deal. That's why I'm not going to go into the details about it. But fighting against climate change or European Green Deal is not only to fight uh, climate change, actually. European Green Deal has a lot of dimensions, economic dimensions and social and healthcare dimensions. So it's a holistic transformation program and European Union in implementing the European Green Deal also aims to become a center of the world for uh, climate related studies and uh, in the climate movement. European Green Deal not only relates to the European Union actually, any 
country or any region who has a social, economic uh, and other relations with the European Union uh, are also affected by the European Green Deal. So it is beyond the European Union, Union itself. After it was adopted in December 2019, it also drew a lot of attention in Turkey. Many industries in Turkey were qu quite curious about how they will be affected and to what extent they would be affected by the European Green Deal. So to answer these questions, TÜSİAD uh, issued a report on December 2020. We also took part in preparation of that report. So we tried to answer how the European Green Deal would affect Turkey. So one of the things that would affect Turkey is the carbon border adjustment mechanism. Since 2005, the European Union has been pricing the carbon industries. And thanks to that, they achieved a lot of reduction in emissions. And it's a well-planned well emission commerce system. This emission trade system had created some problems within the EU. And to remove those problems, in December 2019, uh, this system that was specific to Europe, only applied to within Europe, was spread all over uh, the globe. And it was now called the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism. Its name also changed. So this meant that for each ton of carbon that is exported, which is like 60, 70 euros per ton. And these amounts would be paid for exporters. The second subject would be about circular, circular economy action plan, which is also an important element of the Green Deal. Uh, it's much more comprehensive. It requires a much more comprehensive transformation. From now on, the fridges, washing machines, textile products that we will export to Europe require certain specifications. They cannot go bad. They cannot, you know, break in five years. They should have a lifespan of at least 10 years. They should use 10 liters of water to wash the dishes, etc., etc. So the consumption and production are, in terms of resources and energy efficiency, need to be transformed. They need to be converted green. So back then, this was not there, but a new channel appeared for seemingly only Germany, but in the coming days it will apply to the entire EU probably. The supply chain ethics code, ethics law. Germany passed this law, enacted it last summer. German companies from now on within their supply chains uh, will make sure that SMEs in Turkey uh, are not committing any uh, nature crimes or crimes against human rights because uh, they work so intensely with SMEs from Turkey. They need to make sure that they are working with uh, small and medium scale enterprises that do not pollute the rivers and the air and the soil or uh, work with child labor. Is Turkey prepared for this? So from these three channels, we will have a severe transformation coming. And over these three channels, the idea is to force Turkey to a green transformation process. Europe is an important market for us. Europe has more and more strict rules. So to export to the EU, well, uh, we cannot stop exportation to the EU. Almost half of our exports go to the European Union. So we will, we, we made a calculation of the carbon bill to Turkey. I can skip this part. The carbon border adjustment mechanism, well, uh, they will start paying into it uh, from 2026 for these uh, five um, items, cement, iron, steel, aluminum, fertilizers, and electricity. So the green gas emissions, based on uh, the price of the time, is going to be released. But it starts with five um, products, but in the coming years, there will be many more products to be part of this.
Yes. This is the report I was referring to. It was written by, by Erin Sheldon, Selin Ajar, and myself. And if you're interested, you can get this report from Tusiyat. You can download it. So first, we looked at the sectoral breakdown of green gas emissions in Turkey. Look at power. Total emissions, well, of the total economic source emissions, almost one third comes from thermal power plants. That's a huge issue. It also has a health dimension. Again, agriculture, methane and carbon dioxide emissions are very high. Cement has really high emissions, as you can see. So these will all have costs involved. And this is in million euros. The 50 euro price is taken as a basis here. Our exportation to EU 28. This is the sectoral carbon bill of that alone. Salmon producers, 273.2 million euros. That's the amount that they will have to pay to the EU. So the rate of this within uh, export uh, revenues is even more meaningful. It's in this slide, it's like a tax rate. For cement, it's 21.3%. That's a really high ratio. In the past, well, at the moment, you're exporting 100 euro worth of cement. You put your info in your pocket, your 100 euros, in, and you come to Turkey. But after 2026, you will only be able to net 78.7 euros of that because the 21.3 euros will go to the carbon tax. You will have to incur this. That's a really high amount considering a product that has very low profit margins like cement. If you're losing 21% of your revenues, then that means on a de facto basis, your exports to EU might stop altogether. And it will have social co uh, consequences as well, naturally. And here you can see the other aspect of this. This will not only impact Turkey, but all countries that export to the EU will be impacted. Russia, China, Ukraine, for Turkey, what we export most to Europe are aluminum and steel and iron. We are we have a good position when it comes to steel and iron. The reasons are actually coincidental. We are using electrical furnaces mainly, and we don't have integrated facilities like in Russia. Russia. So the emission intensity is lower. And when it comes to aluminum, we are at a mid-level, medium level. So but of course, we need to consider how this is going to impact Turkey, but also how it's going to impact the entire globe, China, Russia. We need to assume a larger, a broader perspective. I'll skip these. So the second channel, Circular Economy Action Plan. All product specifications require more durable, more efficient, more re reusable, more recyclable, and more repurposable products. For instance, in textiles, the textiles that you produce, well, at least 60% of it must come from recycled fibers. That's the regulation. Our SMEs, our textiles people are now in panic. How will they find so much recycled fiber? I apologize. So what are we talking about here? The circular economy action plan has an important aspect, which is eco-design. You need to make sure your design is eco-friendly. And that is very clear. For instance, I made a comparison of dishwashers. Starting 2021, the dishwashers that will be exported to EU must uh, spend uh, uh, energy and water and make noise at the maximum levels you can see on this table. 
In Turkey, a good A plus dishwasher has values like this. Close, but not there. Still room for improvement. So, finally, as um, Anne also put it at the beginning of her speech, this is not only limited to the EU, it also applies to China, the USA, because we see similar tendencies in other countries as well. And I agree with that. America, China, Japan, in 2050, 2060, not the USA yet, but the, many of these countries are going to be carbon neutral as they have announced. So if you look at these four countries, they are responsible for approximately 80% of the global production and they are aware that we are entering a new era and the rules of the game are changing. As the rules are changing, Turkey needs to adapt to the new game. This is going to benefit interest to Turkey itself which is why there are some important tasks that we need to fulfill. What is Turkey doing? Well, unfortunately, not much until today, nothing regarding climate change. In 1995, the negotiations for the Kyoto Protocol began until 2021, Turkey buried its head in sand. I'm an advanced country, I'm a developed country, I'm a developing country, but well, I'm a developing country, but you placed me in the developed country list, and now I cannot collect any money, blah, blah. All the, these talks made Turkey waste too much time. When you look at European countries, you can see the impacts uh, for a long period. They started the green uh, transformation a very long time ago, one decade ago, one and a half decades ago, which is why Turkey wasted a lot of precious time in, and uh, it's a shame. But anyway, in October 2021, in Glasgow, finally we decided not to be stubborn anymore and Turkey withdrew its request to be placed outside of the list of developed countries and it sets a carbon neutral uh, neutrality pledge uh, but we are at ground zero we are at zero level uh, we are entitled to take the test but are we going to succeed this test are we going to take it and pass it uh, this is all about what we're going to do next the commerce ministry announced an action plan in July 2021, last summer. European Green Deal Action Plan. The idea was to harmonize ourselves with the European Green Deal. And it seemed like we had done some homework. We look like a good student. And many things were touched upon, circular economy, what we are going to do, actions we will take as we transition to the circular economy. But these are all intents. When are we going to abandon fossil? There's nothing about that in the action plan or the thermal plants. Are we going to continue to subsidize them, offer them incentives and encouragement? These need to end. Then, you know, otherwise there is a contradiction. On one hand, you are talking about clean production and circular economy, but 2023 is set as a carbon neutral date, but on the other hand, you can continue supporting thermal plants. These two cannot coexist. You need to choose one of the uh, two. When you consider health aspects, the mucilage problem in the Marmara Sea, the pollution in Ergene, what needs to be opted for is clear. In this regard, I think this is a good opportunity for Turkey. I wish we had initiated this conversion with our own dynamics on time, but the EU with, its, with, with throwing the stick of commerce is now pushing Turkey to a green uh, transformation and I'm happy about it, honestly. Of course, I would prefer a Turkey that would transform with its own dynamics, but at the end of the day, if it's going to end up in the same way, if we will be able to, you know, make people more sensitive about this, then 
the EU Green Deal is going to contribute to our process. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ahmed, for this uh, overview on Green Deal developments uh, in Turkey uh, and yeah, showing us also the, you know, the implication of, of the EU's uh, Green Deal policy uh, for the country in discussions. Um, I would actually, before we turn to Sophie, I would have um, a clarification question for you. Um, as from, from what I understood, uh, you know, the, uh, in terms of uh, Turkey discussing a Green Deal, it, it seemed very much to be uh, as a result, if, if you want, um, of outside pressure. Uh, so, in a sense, a very, you know, uh, I'm not sure it's a very motivating uh, force. I mean, it's a strong economic force, but uh, you mentioned that, you know, the Green, the European Green Deal was, was discussed when it was adopted. So, I wonder if, if, there, if there are or were any discussions that it would, uh, it very much, you know, is an opportunity for Turkey, for example, to to prevent uh, economic crisis like the ones uh, we have been seeing. So, kind of an opportunity for Turkey to you know to achieve a more sustainable and a more uh, rewarding economic system than than the one that's currently existing. Thanks. Uh, um, Thank you, Anne. Well, our studies, all studies, show this actually that the green uh, deal scenarios of Turkey that we work on shows that, you know, if we had a local, you know, uh, system where we would, you know, abandon uh, polluted production and remove our emissions, where would we stand in 2030? Where would we stand in 2050? And what if we continue with the business as usual? What path would we follow then if we went the same way? All the studies show the same thing. Green deal the green transformation is much more rational it's much more reasonable in terms of the economy so if we have a green path in the economy in turkey we will have a higher gross domestic product we will have higher employment we will have less pollution we will have more employment no study has ended up with something controversial to this Turkey is going through a terrible economic crisis at the moment. And the main reason of that is that Turkey, over the past decade, obviously, went through an accelerated, unsustainable growth pattern. Turkey is the fourth, big, big, uh, wanted to be, to be the fourth biggest iron and steel exporter of the world. That was a goal they had. Vision 2023 of AKP, the government party. In 2012, AKP promised to Turkey it when it's 2023, the purse in per capita income will be $25,000. That was their promise. Turkey will be the 10th biggest economy of the world. How are we going to get there? By exporting cement and iron and steel and construction and blah, blah, and infrastructure, etc. Now we see where we stand with that plan. Turkish economy has hit its head against the walls because of the unsustainable growth pattern. Turkish eco economy is in a grand crisis. This story needs to change. The Turkish economy needs a brand new story. I totally agree with you. The green new order is the new story that is being desperately sought by Turkey. And this will have in the economic and ecological and societal sense a much more sustainable growth pattern. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ahmed, for this clarification. And certainly this is something we can uh, discuss further, uh, you know, after the last presentation. And I invite uh, all our participants to please send your comments, send your questions in the Sonosor. Uh, chat function and uh, we will you know relay them uh, after we've now heard uh, the last presentation and for that I would like to uh, turn to my colleague Sophie Peru warm welcome thank you for being with us um, Sophie is EU policy co coordinator at the health and environment alliance and she's coordinating heals overall policy input into decision making processes representing the views of HEAL to the EU institutions and building capacity among HEAL's membership and our partners. She leads our work on zero pollution 
And before joining HEAL, Sophie has worked as an advisor and campaigner at the European Parliament for over five years. So you have the inside uh, view and information on the European institutions. And you will now talk uh, to us about uh, zero pollution. Um, and we've already heard both from Rob and from Ahmed uh, about the, you know, the extent of the pollution crisis, so to speak, and of the pollution challenge. And now uh, turning over to you, the floor is yours for speaking about transitioning to zero pollution. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you, Anna, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me well and see my screen? Excellent. Thank you. So, yes, um, now we're going to talk actually about um, transitioning, but not only about transitioning uh, to zero pollution. We just heard less pollution. Actually, we want more, we want less, we want zero, because that's really the road to better health and um, I'm sure if you are working in the health sector, you're interested in how you um, influence a complex system that is working on, on its own. And actually, this presentation is about the health sector's role in this transition. So let's go and see what it is about. Um, I'm going to tell you a story, a story of the zero pollution uh, ambition of the EU that is actually starting to be a new narrative really now in uh, in the EU. Um, I think right now we are actually able to celebrate the two years of the EU Green Deal. It was released two years ago and really now uh, we are entering this zero pollution age. So what is it and how has it all started? First of all, uh, when, whenever you want to achieve something that big as zero pollution, you need a really a clear objective. And here it is. So HEAL is indeed representing um, a, a broad alliance of, of um, organizations involved in the health sector. So bring, we bring actually those voices together. And what we do is really bring them in a really clear message to the policymaker, to the policymakers directly. So just before the Green Deal was released, what we said was what you see on the screen right now, we just really, before it was released, said zero pollution and health protection need to be at the core of the Green Deal. And then we talk about climate action, clean air and non-toxic environment. So actually, this is the target. This is what we really wanted. And we had a big picture objective also very concretely for each um, policy that we are working on. So on, on climate, uh, on air and on chemicals, where we said what we want and by when. And so, for example, for climate, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, we said need to be reduced by 65 percent by 2030. That's what science is telling. Uh, for air quality, again, uh, what needs to happen is transitioning to full alignment with uh, the W re recommendations because they're science-based and that also needs to happen quickly. And for chemicals, we also had a very clear target moving to a zero um, to 100% non-toxic material cycles by 2030. So that were the big picture objectives uh, that we put into um, really the, the scene at the moment of the cooking of the Green Deal. And this is what we got. So what you see right now on the map is, well, on, on the picture is a map, uh, basically, of what the Green Deal is in the EU. Um, the, so this is an official picture, just with the exception of the little heart uh, here. Um, so you see that we actually got something that we were asking for. We got a zero pollution Europe commitment in the EU Green Deal, and we were very happy about that. But that was just the beginning of the big, um, the, the big journey. So we got the map. We also got a commitment. So the EU Green Deal is actually a text, a communication from the European Commission. And it clearly says um, that all EU actions and policy will have to contribute to the EU Green Deal objectives. Can you imagine how big such an objective is? Because it means that everything the EU does Absolutely everything needs to be coherent and contribute to the EU Green Deal. That's really a big, big self-commitment that the EU did at that moment. And just behind that, just below that, it already was talking about health. So that was a big commitment as well. The policy response must be bold and comprehensive and seek to maximize benefits for health. So when you are representing the health sector, this is keyword you absolutely need to be then using and reusing afterwards to really uh, hold all the policymakers um, committed and accountable. 
to those words. So we got a map, we got an objective, and then we got really a commitment with annexes. And here you see just one little bit of that, of what the EU Green Deal was committing to. And the EU uh, Green Deal was committing to actually go towards a zero pollution ambition for a toxic free environment. Every word counts here. And those are not just words that came in into policy making. They were actually words that we as the health sector were calling for, were asking for. So we actually found them back in, in the documents, in the official documents. And here you have basically the menu of what the Green Deal is going to be. So the menu was, okay, by summer 2020, there would be the release of um, a so-called uh, chemical strategy for sustainability, number one. And number two, there would be a zero pollution action plan for water, air, and soil in 2021. And another do um, document that I will not uh, talk about today. So that was something that was committed to two years ago. Where are we now? We are now with, yes, we did have the release of the chemical uh, strategy for sustainability during the pandemic. Um, so it was a little bit delayed by October, but still in October 2020, we did have the release of a chemical strategy, which is really very ambitious uh, as a program. Then you have, of course, um, the implementation of it, but really getting there was really very important. And yes, we also have now, by now, um, the Zero Pollution Action Plan for uh, water, air, and soil, and I will go a bit more into the detail. So I was saying, yes, you need a big picture objective. That's the direction of the travel. But then you also need um, afterwards, as a second stage, as a second step, to have a narrative. So you need to tell a story because you need to say what needs to happen, what are the actions that you need. And so what does the health sector ask for? The health sector asks for preventing disease, obviously. So how do we do it? In our case here, this is by beating pollution. This is what we basically developed as a story. So we said what we want, what zero pollution means for us, it means beating pollution to prevent disease. And this is how we built the whole story about it. So we actually were building our narrative on what the commission had committed to. The commission had committed to adopt a, um, a zero pollution action plan uh, in 2021. So really before they adopted it, um, we actually pushed our narrative towards uh, them. And so how did we do it? If you say you want to beat pollution and prevent disease, then you also need to say how you do it. So that's the treatment, that's the recipe that we actually uh, asked the Commission to hear and to use. And we said zero pollution means three things. It means zero harm for, from pollution for health. It means zero money. And I think we heard about it uh, in, in the previous um, slides, in the previous speaker slide on what it means to be zero money for pollution. So don't invest any cent anymore into pollution. And it also means at the same time, zero delay in stopping pollution. So very clear, three simple, simple demands that actually uh, we can relate to. And then we developed, um, so in the narrative also developed a representation of what it means. So how do we picture what zero pollution is? What is it? And so we tried to really show that it was talking about everyone. Everyone, everyone is vulnerable to pollution. Some are more vulnerable than others at some moments in their lives, but essentially it means everyone. So this is something we were insisting really a lot on by clearly like really repeating the messages by cutting the pollution at source simple message but actually straightforward by building on the latest science because if it's not the latest science it's not good enough by pre pri prioritizing the prevention and the precaution it's not that obvious you need to repeat it time and time again and all of it needs to be in legislation because this is the tool we absolutely need uh, when you are curing basically um, an ill system that we um, have with the pollution levels that we have. So really building the legislation with the clear goals and timelines. And again, we repeated that we wanted to stop financing pollution, at least um, stopping uh, from the public funds, obviously. 
And we repeated it again. So we contributed to a public consultation and we repeated and repeated what it means uh, to go to zero pollution. So this is another image that we were using, another uh, messaging on Twitter here. Um, another one again, so repeating your message of what you want to achieve, what is the big picture goal by 2040 for climate, by 2030 for air, and also by 2030 for uh, chemicals. And we repeated again. So once we had the big picture and the narrative, then there comes really the cooking moment, the collective cooking moment of the policy. How do you contribute from where you are, for example, as the health sector? How do you input in something that is actually bigger than just you, but you want to input? Absolutely. So how do we do it? Uh, in the EU, indeed, you can contribute by uh, contributing through public consultations. This is a very important tool because this is a, a specific way to convey your message to the policymakers. And here the key word is transparency. So whatever stakeholders are saying is made public. And here I want to insist on one thing. Every, every voice counts, every message counts. What is important is to repeat your message time and time again. Don't don't be um don't don't don't worry if you feel a bit small, it's it's okay because every voice counts really. Um, here you have the responses. So you just see that for example to cook the zero pollution action plan, what the commission received is almost 700 responses to their public consultation. That's actually important to highlight that half of those responses were um, citizens, individual citizens. So that's half of it. And then you have stakeholders that are a bit more organized, I would say. So obviously you have the business associations here, it's 12%, um, um, a bit more than that. And then you have the non-governmental organization like HEAL, like us. And here we are a bit less uh, than 10% of the respondents. So you feed and you fit into the overall, uh, you know, team of who is actually contributing to this. And it's really important. That's the moment to uh, really relay the message. So once all this consultation had taken place, the commission actually released uh, what it had committed to release. Uh, and that happened on, on the 12th of May this year. So yeah, it's um, a few months now. And the, the commission came out with its uh, zero pollution action plan for um, so air, water and soil. It was made public and it was a document of 20 pages, a bit more, with um, a few you know, assessments of what the situation is uh, according to the Commission and what should happen because of the situation we are in. So remember, I was saying we need to have clear objectives. So what the Commission did is, yes, here are the objectives we have, and we also ask for a timeline. So the Commission said, OK, we have a vision towards 2050. Obviously, for health protection and for disease prevention, 2050 is far too far away. And uh, so, yeah, we had a, a commitment on a timeline, but it was too far in, in time. Then the commitment on goals and, and clear milestones. Um, one big, big element for, for HEAL, for example, is to prevent air pollution at source and really with clear objectives. So the Commission indeed listened to us in the sense that, yes, it's, it's coming forward with something on air quality and it is committing um, the EU to improve air quality to reduce the number uh, of premature death by air pollution by 55%. And this is by 2030. And you have other targets as well. So yes, we have the objectives, we have the timeline, and then we have a list of action. This is an official document as well. This is the annex to the uh, Zero Pollution Action Plan. And so here you see how the Commission has, it's, it's, it's just a picture of it, it's not a full annex, but you see how the Commission is working, like number one, number two, etc. This is what we want to do, and this is by when we want to do it. So here is the commitment. And number one is to revise the ambient air quality directives uh, by, uh, well, in 2022. So this is coming uh, pretty soon. So this is a very important moment for the health sector to engage in the EU and actually also beyond in asking for what I was telling about, um, in asking for full alignment of the EU standards that are binding limits um, with the latest science and which is 
what we have from the WHO recommendations that are very uh, fresh right now um, on air quality. So big momentum right now on this, and it is cooking, I can tell you. So yes, after the objectives, um, the big picture and contributing by bringing your message to the policymakers, then comes the fourth moment. This is the moment of truth, time to assess what we got. So here you have the link uh, to the action plan that I was just talking about. And here is our assessment. So remember we had said zero harm from pollution, zero money for pollution, zero delay in stopping pollution. And then we had a bit more detailed asks, but broadly speaking, this is the picture of what we got, how we are assessing it. And what we got was actually a pretty mixed picture. Two very positive elements came uh, in the Zero Pollution Action Plan in our view. Um, first of all, finally, you have an official recognition of the magnitude of the challenges relating to, air to, to, to the pollution in, in the broad sense. So yes, finally, we are, on we are in line with um, what is being uh, the level of the problem. Second element, Yes, you finally have a recognition of the health inequalities that are linked to pollution and really a real recognition of vulnerable groups as such. So good. Yes, we agree on the picture, but now we don't agree at all on the level of ambition the Commission is putting in front of those challenges. Why? Because we did not see in the in the plan that we had um, the adequate goals we were asking for with the binding action to stop pollution without delay. So zero delay, we did not get that. It was really far too far away in time. Secondly, we did not get a commitment to really binding action to stop the health harm through full alignment of the legislation with the latest science. Because at the moment of the release of the Zero Pollution Action Plan, we, don't, we did not get a commitment from the Commission to fully align, for example, on air quality with, um, with the WHO's re recommendations and the latest science. We just got a commitment to align more closely, which is absolutely not good enough. And thirdly, we did not get what we were asking in zero money for pollution uh, in the recovery from COVID. So we did not get uh, zero pollution conditionality in the recovery and other financing. So we communicated about that. We said we were not happy about what we had. We said it's not good enough. It needs to be better. And here are what health groups are actually asking in, instead of what we got. So we said, okay, this is not what is good. And this is what we're asking for. So is it the end of the story when you get um, the plan released? Actually, absolutely not. It's just one part of the cycle, the long cycle of transitioning. Once you have the plan, then once you have assessed it, then comes the moment of repeating your message again until you get to what you're asking. So um, we had a moment, we had an opportunity to repeat this again very quickly because uh, every year the European Commission is organizing a so-called EU Green Week. It's uh, happening normally the first week of June or at, at that time. And this time for the first time, it was completely um, dedicated to zero pollution. So big moment, a very good opportunity to actually say, look, it's not good enough. You need to get better and repeat that message again and again. So that's just what we did. We were on those panels and we were repeating that message. So now what is next? Um, now that we have the plan, now that we have assessed it, uh, actually now is the time to get back to the big picture and to repeat a new cycle because now it's the implementation phase. So, for example, in two days, the uh, EU Commission is launching a so-called zero pollution stakeholder platform, which is supposed to actually help the Commission to implement the, um, the zero pollution action plan and the zero pollution ambition. So what the policymaker is actually doing, they are asking for help to help them actually deliver on what they committed. So this is where we actually come back to square one and we'll actually say again what needs to happen. So every opportunity to actually bring the message out on health benefits of policy action to end pollution, you absolutely need to use it. And you know that nobody else than the health sector can do it in such a powerful way. So it's really important that the health sector speaks up on this. And this is my last slide. Just to summarize, what does it mean to transition? 
To transition means that you need to know where you are and where you want to go. So to really have a clear view of what your big picture objective is as a collective. Then you build a narrative. It takes time, but it's super important to really get it right and to do it and to make it understandable that, pe that people can embark with you on your messaging. And then actually you need to build the coalition. So really every to invite everybody who wants to join you. Then you get to something, you assess it, and you start again. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sophie, for this presentation and for for showing how important it is to have, uh, you know, a zero pollution uh, goal uh, established. Uh, and then if you want, uh, you know, providing us uh, with a recipe on, on how to get uh, to concrete action, as you say, in transitioning. And yeah, for, you know, those uh, colleagues of the Turkish health sector um, as, a, as an opportunity to pick up. Okay, we now have about uh, 20 minutes left for some uh, further discussion. And again, I invite uh, participants to uh, give your comments and questions via the Sonosor button. We have already uh, received two, so I'm just going to bring them in uh, in the order that we received them. And the first one uh, goes to Rob. And this is a question, uh, I think, about the, the urgency to act and also the level of ambition. Uh, as you mentioned, Rob, that um, what your, uh, your, your, your key demand is to, to achieve uh, emission cuts by um, 2030, 2035. And uh, we have a participant wondering how realistic that is to achieve these uh, emission cuts, uh, you know, further than 20, um, more swiftly than 2050. Thank you. I think it's kind of not a question of whether it's realistic or not. It, it's what the science is showing that we have to do. 2050 is too late. Net zero by 2050 is far too late and far too little. We need to actually dissect what net zero by 2050 actually means. So for starters, net zero doesn't mean zero carbon. What net zero actually means, it means this, you know, sort of equilibrium balance, as you will, you know, between uh, the emissions that we're, you know, producing and the emissions that are being absorbed. And the big problem in the plan, big problem, for example, for the EU Green Plan and other uh, climate mechanisms for the UNF, triple C and in more broadly is that the technology to absorb those emissions doesn't exist yet. Not nearly, you know, let alone not, not nearly on the scale that we need them. So the only choice we have is rapid decarbonization as quickly as possible. Um, you know, whether it's realistic or not, we've got to make it realistic. Um, that's kind of the job of us in the climate movement, you know, whether we're in the climate and health movement is to build social power around these concepts to the point that, you know, those with power have no choice but to implement the things we're calling for. You know, from the standpoint of where we are right now, yes, it feels very daunting, but the, but, you know, the potential damage that can be done, irreparable damage that could be done to human civilization, let alone the rest of life on this planet, if we don't do this, Will be far worse um you know the un you know the cop 26 climate talks have just happened in glasgow for all of the small wins that we can pick out of it the i think someone did a, a study on what the what what sort of uh amount of warming were to expect with the mechanisms that were put in place in glasgow and they still amount to about 2.4 degrees of warming and that's a very very generous estimate you know there are other there are other people who've done research who are you know, suggesting that we could be seeing three to six degrees of warming by the end of the century. Um, you know, let there be no room for doubt. That is a mass extinction scenario. Um, so I think we really need to flip on, flip on its head this concept of what we see as realistic and what isn't realistic. Thank you very much. Uh, anyone else wants to react? Ahmed or Sophie? Yeah, Sophie. Ah, sorry, Ahmed, you want to go first, yeah. Go ahead, Sophie, please. Thanks. Yeah, I just wanted to highlight that this is a question we hear a lot, actually. What is realistic and how do we, and, and, and what can we uh, have happened? Um, but um, I think the first step, you need to acknowledge that it is difficult, that it seems big. And it's okay, it's completely okay to find it difficult. But I fully, fully, fully um, endorse what Rob just said, like make it happen because the other option is the one that is not realistic. So exactly, big support. 
And I just want to give a kind of like a, a positive message. Uh, like, I mean, uh, in Turkey, like we have been kind of ignoring the, the fact of climate change for so long. But only uh, in last November, we, I mean, the Turkish government changed its uh, stance against the climate change. And think about US. I mean, we used to have Trump and uh, he was also a climate change denier. Uh, now, you know, as of at the end of 2022, at least uh, the US has changed, Turkey has changed. So I just want to uh, stop this, uh, I mean, conversation with a, a positive message that at least we are in a better uh, place as compared to, let's say, two years ago. So this is something, uh, but of course, I agree with Rob uh, and Sophie. Uh, there are things that we need to uh, think carefully and uh, make those things more stringent uh, in order to be able to live in, on this planet. Thank you. Thank you very much for highlighting this. And I, I found a very a comforting um, a comment also after after the COP, after this uh, yeah this outcome, which uh, for me, uh, you know, did not reflect uh, you know the the urgency of of what we're up against, uh, unfortunately. And and there was a comment who said it's it's now really uh, you know this COP has really shown that it's it's actually you know to to civil society and and uh, you know and and to social movements uh, in bringing forward uh, the change that is needed. And I think that is what what you say, uh, Ahmed, as well. Thank you. Okay, actually, uh, this brings us right to the next question, which is about uh, the Paris Agreement. And that was a question to you, Ahmed, uh, a clarification question. Um, yeah, there seems to have been a debate in the media and social media circles that uh, the Paris Agreement only covers oil. Um, yes, does this agreement limit the use of coal or is it, uh, yeah, what's the status? And if you could uh, also answer this more generally on, on your thoughts on the on the importance um, of of Turkey ratifying the agreement and the you know the implications this means uh, this has for the country. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, uh, uh, the, the Paris Agreement actually foresees a kind of exit from fo all fossil fuels, and the fossil fuels are we know the petroleum, oil, uh, coal, natural gas, and things like this. But I think. At the end of COP26 meeting, India insisted on uh, kind of uh, rephrasing the, uh, the message that, you know, maybe not limiting uh, 100%, but using coal in the transition period of, uh, you know, decarbonization and things like this. Of course, these are all discouraging, but uh, we know what kind of work we you need to have at the end of the century. This is uh, this should be free from all fossil fuels and nuclear as well. There are two reports actually on the Turkish economy on the uh, decarbonization possible decarbonization pathways for Turkish economy uh, recently published uh, like a month ago. Uh, net zero. I think from the IPC, Istanbul Policy Center, and the Beyond Call movement. Uh, so for interested audience, they can go and check. Uh, so the clear message of these two reports is that by 2030, uh, you know, fossil exiting for Turkey is possible without uh, causing no harm to economic growth and without resorting to alternative uh, power uh, sources like nuclear energy. As you may know, Turkey is now constructing a very expensive uh, nuclear power plant at the you know, Mediterranean coast at Akkuyu. Uh, and this is, this is ridiculous. I mean, like if you look at the, the budget that goes to uh, construct this facility, and these two reports show that, look, we don't need for energy security for no reasons we need uh, such a big uh, harmful investment. So by 2020, 30, Turkey can continue to grow economically without the fossil fuels. I mean, that's, that's a, a clear message. And uh, I think uh, 
like if you think about the current account deficit caused by the fossil fuel uh, imports, you know, to Turkey, uh, these are neither economically nor ecologically, you know, sustainable policies. So uh, this is what we need to do. We need to. Uh, so again, I welcome the uh, 2053 carbon neutrality pledge of the government, but this is not enough. We need to also pledge the carbon, you know, fossil exit date for Turkey as well. And all these scientific reports uh, show that by 2030, this is possible without nuclear energy. Thank you. Thank you very much for clarifying that. That, that was very um, helpful and important. Uh, we have received uh, two questions, which um, also was my my question for, for a conversation. And that is about the role of the health sector. Uh, and I think it's very, uh, you know, uh, natural to speak about that. And uh, yes, you know, we have participants wondering, you know, what is the role of the health sector in bringing about a green deal or green new deal? And uh, yeah, I guess also what, you know, what Turkish participants can can uh, take away uh, from this. And um, I wanted to turn to Rob and ask you first, since you mentioned uh, that you're running the campaign, uh, and I guess, you know, speaking about uh, greening of the economy is not uh, the bread and butter um, for a health professional or someone from the health sector. So yeah, can you share some of, you know, lessons learned, uh, what has work worked well in terms of engaging uh, the health community? Sure. Um... So I think the most important thing to remember, first of all, and I think it's very easy for people working in the health sector to, to forget this, is that the majority of you, if not all of you, are naturally gifted communicators. You have to be by the very nature of your job. Uh, and that actually, you know, compared to, you know, a lot of other groups of people, you know, you know, that that, that level of communication, those skills are very effective. Um, you know, an answer to this question that gets brought out a lot is kind of about the, the trusted role that health professionals have in society. Personally, if I can offer a bit of a challenge to this usual answer is I think this is kind of overstated a little bit. And I don't think actually that is that really underpins the importance of the health community within addressing the climate crisis. You know, I think sometimes no offense to anyone on the call intended, you know, but I think sometimes doctors have maybe a little bit of inflated <laughs> sense of self-importance and think that people care more about what they're saying than they actually do. The importance of the health community is more that it is such a pervasive sector of society. It's something that touches all parts of society and people working in the health sector, whether you're a porter or a nurse or a doctor, no matter where you are in the health service, you see and experience things that relate to the need for a just transition and a Green New Deal. Uh, even if you don't, you know, necessarily realize it all the time. Just like that video that I played during my talk earlier of Dr. Abdul Al Said, he, uh, you know, was an accidental environmentalist. And so many people who I've come into contact with in my work describe themselves similarly. You know, it was when they saw a patient that um, couldn't afford to heat their home or a patient who was mentally burnt out from working in insecure jobs or you know, to be more direct, patients who had experienced flooding or other, you know, catastrophes related to ecological destruction. Um, being able to communicate those experiences uh, so clearly and be able to talk so precisely about the ways they've actually impacted physical and mental health is the clarity that the public needs. There was some research done that showed that actually when it comes to messaging on climate change, a public health framing on the climate crisis is one of the most effective because it's the most direct and it's the most sort of clear in terms of how are things actually going to impact us. So, you know, something that we've been doing in the UK um, is we've been doing a lot of lobbying and building pressure for certain legal changes. Uh, but within that, you know, it, our broader mission is to build social power. So members of the campaign have been going out and running climate clinics uh, in towns and cities where they're just setting up these makeshift clinics in the middle of like public areas and they're talking to members of the public about what the problems are and what can we do about them. Um, and I think that is one of the most effective things that like we've seen just so much incredible engagement and change already from stuff like that happening. Um, and I think that's it really. I think it's, you know, using that, that sort of experiential power. Um, and that's why I think we shouldn't get distracted with, you know, these 
questionable notions of whether or not you know it's about like social trust or whatever social trust or no social trust health professionals have these incredible experiences that they can talk about effectively and that's the most important thing if that makes sense thank you very much uh, sophie uh, i'd like to turn to you and ask you yes you know what's the What's the importance, uh, you know, of the health sector in, in bringing forward uh, zero pollution and what's your experience on how it has, uh, such a framing has resonated with them? Thanks. Uh, I would not even talk about importance. I would say it's just essential. Uh, your role as health professionals is essential in making it happen because actually, um, yes, I mean, what Rob just described, you, you know better than anybody else what's happening. So what has worked, there are different levels of engagement and it's, I mean, everybody understands that you already have your job, like a full-time job. And on top of this, actually, there is this social engagement in, in acting on policies directly. And probably that's not something that you feel trained for, but that's okay. Because um, one thing that you can do is uh, already like, support statements that are out there uh, to, to speak up. Uh, so basically to add your voice to something that is being said, but you can also go to really higher levels of engagement. You, you can actually yourself communicate really um, to, to journalists about what you see because because they need to know, they need to interview you on this. And then the next level is to go and talk to policymakers directly. And so that that's actually what what Hill does all the time, basically to bring what uh, the health sector is seeing to directly um, talk to the policymakers to actually meet with them. So the moments we had this experience of policymakers hearing what the health sector is saying, and the health sector is very broad. It's doctors, but it's also nurses, and it's also, uh, for example, um, the in insurers, but it's also the patients directly themselves. And when this community talks with one voice, this is very, very powerful. So um, don't underestimate really the essentiality of your role, I would say. Thank you. And Ahmed, you mentioned earlier that uh, the Ministry of Commerce, they had uh, put forward a draft plan or, you know, some thinking on, on the Green Deal and uh, fossil fuels were not mentioned in this. So, you know, how is this something the, the Turkish health sector could pick up and uh, you know bring forward that there is there is a clearer uh, framework towards a fossil fuel phase out. Uh, yes, you're right. I mean, uh, they published this report. Uh, it's an action plan. Uh, it's actually a literature survey for me. You know, like every scientific document should have a kind of section, uh, like a literature review. So the Turkish uh, bureaucrats actually at the Ministry of Trade. Uh, so. It seems that they know what to do. Of course, there are some uh, missing uh, elements. One of them is the fossil fuel exit date. And the second one is the just transition. This is also a very big, uh, very important uh, component of uh, green transition that is missing in the Turkish action plan. But uh, I mean, uh, at the time of the writing of this report, that there was no uh, carbon neutrality pledge at the end because it's like four months before the government announced the uh, carbon neutrality pledge. So this is understandable. Uh, but and also in the next uh, in the coming months, uh, we are expecting that the Ministry of Trade under I mean the, under the leadership of uh, Ministry of Trade. Uh, they are going to come up with a revised uh, action plan. And in this revised action plan, just transition and the fossil fuel exit dates should be mentioned uh, very clearly uh, in, in the document. Uh, this is what we are expecting, actually, because otherwise then it will be very contradictory, right? So like, and it is very easy to make these linkages between the you know zero pollution and uh, health of the people, uh, especially the Istanbul region, Izmit region, highly industrialized. Uh, there are a lot of uh, facilities around the Marmara uh, region, Marmara Sea, uh, right? And they are kind of dumping their dirt to Marmara Sea. And last summer we had this mucilage problem in the Marmara Sea. You know all these white uh, layers uh, on top of the uh, things, but 
you know, those are not surprising. Like if you, and I remember it's one of your counterparts, I think in organizing this event from the Kojeli University and like 10 years ago, 15 years ago, uh, there was a scientist actually wrote a report on the, uh, you know, heavy metal, uh, you know, accumulation in the breasts of the, uh, you know, young mothers. So this research, then it made public, it kind of, you know, shocked very, you know, very much the society. But what the government, how the government responded is that, you know, they just banned the uh, report and kicked that guy, you know, very prominent scientist working at the university by the time, uh, they just lay him off, right? Uh, so, like it was like 15 years ago. So can you imagine like if the government took that report seriously, like 15 years ago, today, we may not have this mucilage problem at the Marmara Sea and we were like, you know, the health uh, problems very much resolved. So you need to take actions, okay? Writing the action plans, you know, they are very nice on the paper, but if you don't implement them, it, it means nothing. So that is the problem of Turkey nowadays. Uh, so we know, we seem to know what we need to do, but when it time comes to implementation, there is nothing, nothing, right? So uh, I started my kind of this Q&A session with a positive uh, statement, but now finishing with a very pessimist uh, statement no uh let me become positive again uh i think uh like all the trade unions in turkey all the civil society organizations including the health sector this is a uh, this is this should be top on their agenda as well okay so if we kind of as rob says like if you if we managed to make this, uh, you know, top item in our agenda, okay, uh, we can make it. Nowadays, only the business community actually deals with the, you know, Green New Deal, Green Transformation, and that's not a surprise because they know that they are going to face huge economic costs if they don't adapt to the Green New Deal. But, you know, for ordinary citizens, it's also important because because this is who, you know, this is we are going to lose our jobs if we don't adapt to the European Green Deal. This is we actually, ordinary people who are going to, you know, continue to be polluted. And, you know, uh, uh, so this is actually our problem. And uh, this is, this is us actually to, you uh, make it uh, as our top item in our agenda yeah wonderful thank you. thank you very much ahmed for this closing words as we've reached the end of our session and i also like your point on that we have to take action we simply cannot afford to not be active and and be engaged uh, and that's that's so true so with that i would like to uh, close this panel and uh, berka if you could just uh, bring up the last two slides please as I mentioned in the beginning, this was a webinar as part of a, an EU-funded project. Uh, and if you have now, you know, uh, really, uh, you know, uh, have new insights into this topic, if you want to continue the conversation on what needs to happen around climate change uh, action or, you know, Green New Deal, we invite you to, um, you know, become a part of the GSIP network. Um, you know, we have uh, working groups. Um, there are also regular mailings. So please don't hesitate uh, to get in touch with uh, colleagues uh, Funda and Berkai here. Um, and then the last slide, I would just like to say a, a big thank you uh, to our three excellent panelists here today. Uh, you've all gave very rich presentations and thank you so much, so much for all your insights and inspiration uh, in, in the face of the challenge uh, that we are, um, as Ahmed you just said, we're all facing. I would also like to thank um, our translators and uh, our technical support with Özge Gündüz, Estin Aslan and Ömer Altay. 
And last but not least, uh, thank you to all your participants who were there. I understand we had over 130 uh, people listening in. So uh, wishing you a good rest of the day, good conference, and hope you can take what you heard today uh, further with you uh, in your work and in your life. And thank you very much. Have a good day.